uh, reach our uh, lives out to you this morning and say greetings. Uh, James is here in our church body this morning along with Judy, so thank you guys for coming. Uh, of course, Michael and my wife is still here, but uh, we're, we're here because of Jesus. That's why we're here. It's because of the love of Christ that's in our hearts. We want to join together want to be together because the Lord says to don't forsake the gathering of the saints. Uh, we're supposed to collectively meet together um, and, and pour ourselves over the scriptures. Um, and that's what we're doing this morning. We're going to pour ourselves over the scriptures. And hopefully all week long, everybody has been pouring themselves over the scriptures. That's our tuning fork. The scriptures are and is the tuning fork. So uh, have you, if you're walking around trying to find pitch in life, and we all are, right? We're trying to find pitch. Um, we need to get to the original tuning fork, the original frequency, um, and that way we get in tune. And so we hum the frequencies of the Lord. That's what we hum, right? That's what we should be humming, humming every day. You know, the Lord is my strength. I shall not want. I mean, all these things the Lord should be moving in our hearts and, and, and doing those things. And that's, that's the pattern. That's the pattern, getting in tune with the Lord. And that's what we're doing this morning is getting in tune with the Lord. So I just want to reach out to the World Wide Web through YouTube. Thank you, YouTube. It's amazing how much information you can get on YouTube. So if you want to learn how to cook a roast, look up it on YouTube. If you want to learn how to skate, go on YouTube. Uh, if you want to have a church, come and see us. We're your cyber church here on YouTube every Sunday at 11 o'clock. So join our little family. And what we're going to do in this family that we're doing is we're going to pour ourselves again out over the scriptures. It's important that we do that. Um, why? Because again, that gets us in tune. When you pour yourself out on the scriptures, you pour yourself out in that and then, then the scriptures pour into you. So you pour yourself out in the scriptures and then the scriptures pour into you. And it's important that we have that because that's our tuning for it. So if things go awry, things go wrong or things aren't going the way it should be going, what we can do is again, get the information from the scriptures, get in tune with what the scriptures teach, put the boat back right side up, get the truck right side up, get your lives right side up and start trucking down the road with Christ. That's the whole point. In the love of Christ. Um, too often we make it about things, don't we? We make it about the building, or we make it about um, our jobs, or it, we make it about other things. So the, the important thing is in the tuning process with God, he says, seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added onto you. So again, it puts everything in the perspective. It puts everything in a sequential order. Just like God showed us as children, the first thing we do is we crawl. And then the next state from crawling is what? Walking. So you crawl, you stand, you start walking. Then after you're walking, then you start running. I'm watching my grandson do that, little Brody. He's, he does the, the crawl thing. And then from the crawl thing, he went into standing. And then, then he, now he's into walking. And now he's so... Uh, and now he's into trying to run now. And uh, it's funny to watch him. He'll be walking and then he'll do his head like this all around and, and you can see him kind of wavering around. Why? Because he lost his focus and that's, that's what happens to him and that's what happens to us. We do this, we lose our focus. We lose our bearings. And that's why we pour ourselves again into the scriptures, pour ourselves into what the scriptures are teaching. So this morning... Get a grip. That's the title of the message. Get a grip. And we need to hold on to that grip. And, and the grip is the scriptures. The grip is the word of God. It's important that we understand that. It's important that we set the preeminence to scriptures. Too often it's about the building. It's about our church. It's about this, this uh, ministry. It's about that ministry. Or it's even about me. Um, and that's really not... Um, the sequential order uh, has to be about the scriptures, knowing the scriptures, studying the scriptures. Um, and by doing so, we'll find out that by me doing that, I'll be a team player. That's really what happens. If you give somebody the scriptures and just set them on an island somewhere and tell them to read through the scriptures uh, for the next 20 years, 
um, they're going to come away a different person. They're going to come away as a team player because that's what scriptures teach us is to be a team player. If I'm a team player, what happens is I'm going to have to be selfless and I'm going to have to serve others. That's what a team player does, right? You're on a team. I'm all about me on the team. Well, you're going to get cut from the team because this has to be a team. It's a team effort, not an individual effort. So it's important. So we got to fight for God's team. If you're on God's team, be a team player and, uh, and stay focused in God's ways. Um, again, that keeps us in, um, in sync with what God's doing. Um, so what we left off last week in 2 Thessalonians chapter 12, uh, chapter 2, verse 12, we left off last week. Um, and um, again, 2 Thessalonians and 1 Thessalonians is written um, to admonish them that they thought they had missed the rapture. Again, so people say, well, there's no rapture. Well, you got to read First and Second Thessalonians in its context and find out Paul's writing to them because they thought the tribulation that they were experiencing was brought on because they had missed the rapture. They, that's why what's all this tribulation going on? And so um, that's why Paul admonished them again to get back to what he taught them, get back to the, the understanding of the second coming of the Lord, which is going to be uh, when he sets his feet on Mount Olive uh, and it splits in two. That's when Christ's second coming. But before that, um, Second Thessalonians is teaching us that there's a rapture. There's an actual rapture of the church, the catching away. And again, that's God's pattern. That's God's tuning. If you're tuned into his frequency, you'll know that God saved Noah and his family from the flood. So in his, he, he, he set them aside and destroyed the unrighteousness on the earth. We see Lot um, being saved from Sodom and Gomorrah. So it's another picture of God saving the righteous from the unrighteous judgment. And that's what Christianity is about. We're all unrighteous. In fact, the Bible teaches us that our own righteousness is of filthy rags, disgusting, filthy rags. So anybody that thinks they have enough in them to muster up enough righteousness, the Bible, on the other hand, tells us it can't be so. Our righteousness is, has to be imputed into us. It has to be given to us. That's the only way we're going to get righteous is, is, it been, is it gifted to us. Um, and that's what God has done. That's the grace of God. He has gifted us um, with righteousness. So um, again, the pattern is that God is sparing the, the righteous. And again, we're righteous because we raised our hand and said, I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe in my heart. God raised them from the dead and I'm saved. Um, now that I'm saved, um, Acts 1.8 says, Jesus was speaking before he parted. He said, wait and tear in Jerusalem to receive power from on high when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you'll be a witness. So let me just clarify. Um, when the Spirit of God, people say, well, do you have the Spirit of God? Well, have you set, accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes, I have. You have the Spirit of God. Now, talks about in the Scriptures about the Spirit coming upon you. We have the Spirit in us, and we have where the Spirit comes upon us. And again, it's affirmation. Um, it's approval. So when we're doing the right thing, the Spirit of God comes upon you. When you're doing the wrong thing, the Spirit of God doesn't come upon you. And you should feel that. And that's why we need to be sensitive. That's why we need to be compassionate. That's why we need to be loving. That's why we need to be uh, serving one another. Because if you serve one another, you'll see that they need something. And if you see that they need something, you see that there was a lack. Same thing in your own life. If you have lack of the Holy Spirit, you should see that. Too often, we don't see that, and then we fabricate the Holy Spirit and start doing st stuff that says, oh, that's the Spirit, because I'm doing this, and that's the Spirit. Well, that's not the case, because the Holy Spirit 
um, is going to do stuff that your mind is going to say, that's crazy. Jesus got baptized. First thing the Spirit did was drove him to the wilderness. That's what he did. The Holy Spirit drove Jesus out into the wilderness. Now, that's the Holy Spirit, folks, driving Jesus out into the wilderness. Now, if you tell people in the prosperity doctrine that Jesus is driving me out to the wilderness, they're going to say you're crazy. You're supposed to be hooked up, hopped up in all your prosperity stuff that that shows you because of all that stuff that God loves you and you're filled with the spirit because of all these things you got. Well, that's not the case. The Holy Spirit is there to get us through the times when you have nothing, when you have no lack. That's what the Holy Spirit's there for. So now in America, we are so hooked up and hopped up and so blessed with these mega, mega buildings that we've fabricated, mega, mega gatherings we've, we're doing, and we think that's the Holy Spirit is doing that. I think we're doing that because I see the Holy Spirit in the need when we have lack. That's the Holy Spirit. Driving Jesus out into the wilderness. 40 days and 40 nights, he was tempted. Um, so I think today, if that happened, people think you're crazy. We'd think that you're absolutely nuts. And that's not the spirit to drive you into the wilderness. Well, that's what the scriptures teach us. And so here, get a grip. That's the teaching for today. Get a grip. We got to get a grip of God. We got to get a grip on him. And not let go. I don't know about any of you, but when I need to get a grip on something and I lose that grip, it, it, it's not a good feeling. It's not a good feeling to lose your grip. Um, and Paul is admonishing them there in Thessalonica. Pick it up on chapter 2, verse 13 of 2 Thessalonians. I'm reading now the NLT. It says, as for us, we can't help but thank God for you. See this appreciation? Here's Paul. He's thanking God for them in there in Thessalonica. These are the first Christians that were established. And Paul's thanking God for them. That's what we need to do right now. We need to thank God for other believers. Why? Because it affirms to us there is a Christ. There is a God. Because we're all believing. Isn't that an affirmation? So when you see all these people following Christ, following the teachings following the word of God, doing le less with themselves and more with others, living and serving one another, loving each other. That's affirmation that Christ is alive and Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. That's, that's proof that today it's, he's still alive. So Paul's thanking God for them. Dear brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord we are also thankful that God chose you to be among the first to experience salvation. We should be experiencing, every one of us should be experiencing salvation. If you're not experiencing salvation, you might be experiencing other things that you've, you've placed yourself into. And it's, we'd all do it. We all go out and experience other stuff. But if I'm experiencing God, I don't want to experience anything else. Because I'm filled with him, the creator of the universe, Jesus Christ living in my heart, living in your hearts. Allow him to, allow him to have complete control of your life. Allow his love to permeate your life and experience him. You don't want to experience anything else on the world. That's why Paul can say, I'm content in all things. Hopefully that's us today. And we can be content in all things. So we're thankful that God chose you. And again, um, <clears throat> this idea of choosing is, um, there's, a, there's a doctrine that's, um, that is uh, well known. It's Calvinism that talks about that God uh, predestined each one of us that is going to know him and be saved by him, that he chose you, and he did before the foundations of the world. Um, and, um, and so what's happening here is Paul's saying, God chose you. 
And that's something that we all need to uh, grab a hold of. So often, um, I don't know how many of you out there listening and here that um, football uh, teams are, they're going to choose or baseball teams are going to choose. Um, when I was a young kid, uh, I didn't have real good hand-eye coordination because my eyes weren't uh, in sync. And so um, I was on certain sports, I was chosen one of the first ones like football and stuff like that. But in baseball and hand-eye coordination, I wasn't chosen. And let me tell you something, it doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel good not to be chosen. Um, we, we get hurt by that. Um, it, it can be painful. Um, but God chose us, chose you. That should be a, 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 a confidence builder in Christ right there, that, that God chose me. He chose me. If you accepted Christ into your heart, believe that God raised him from the dead. You're saved. You've been chosen. So that means, that means before the foundations of the world, God knew you and he chose you. You've accepted it. You've, you, you've made acknowledgement. You've received that free gift. That's why all are called, but few are chosen. That means you, few choose to accept Christ. But Christ knew that you were going to choose him. So he knew before the foundation of the world. That's why he chose you, because he knew that you were going to choose him. Thank God for that. Thank God for that. That's why we have a family in Christ. That's why we have gatherings. We gather like this because, um, because of him, because of each other. We can, we can love each other and we can fellowship with one another uh, underneath the heading of the scriptures and, and, and allow, allow that uh, fellowship with one another to encourage one another, to build one another up. Um, that's what we need to do. That's what we should be doing. So God chose you to be among the first to experience salvation. Uh, a salvation that came through the Spirit who makes you holy and through your belief in the truth. See, God makes you holy. I'm not holy because I'm holy. I'm holy because God's holy. That's why we're holy. And that's what we have to understand is God's made this system we accept his system. We submit to his system. We allow his system to work, not my system. I don't know about you, but I've been messed up in my system. Uh, I have problems even today. That when I start thinking about myself, this is when I implode. This is when I think, oh, I didn't get my just reward. Oh, I've been short, sh shorted here. Oh, I'm the, and I get, you start looking at yourself like that. And, and your flesh, all your flesh is going to do is, be, is, is get mad. Because it didn't get what it wants. And you start feeding your flesh, it's going to want more and more and more. That's why we're, we're selfless. We put God on, this, on the throne. We become humble, selfless, and to be submitted to him. That keeps us in check because this flesh is whacked out. It's going to just want... You look at the world, how crazy it is. We kill each other. That's how much the flesh is so stupid. Another human being, we're going to kill another human being. Are you crazy? And then we'll go save some whales, but we'll kill each other. And then we'll go find some bird, extinct bird, and start. We should protect that because God told Adam, this is your planet. Take care of it. We should take care of the birds, oceans, rivers. We should take care of all that stuff. We've been, we've been entrusted to do that. Yes, we should do that. But we can't take human life in place other things above human life. Can't do that. That's why Christianity is so important. That's why Christianity esteems human life. It honors human life. That's what we need to do. That's why these religions that are killing each other is absolutely nuts. Now again, Christianity was not the Crusades. Let's get that clarified in history. Christians didn't do that. It was the Roman Catholic Church, so let's make that clar clarification. Uh, Constantine and the whole cr crazy stuff with the cross. It's not Christianity because they put a cross on their shields and go out there and they won the battle and that's how they're going to crusade like that. That's not Christianity. Let's get that straight. Scriptures don't teach that. Scriptures never teach that. Uh, we're to follow the scriptures, the teachings of the scriptures. Um, 
And if the law of the land, we're to obey the law of the land, until the law of the land tells you to go against the scriptures. That's why before 1859, all the laws of the land were always subject to the scrutiny of how does it line up to scripture? Look it up. 1859 was an earmark that changed the way we started implementing the, uh, the legal system, legislative system, the judicial system changed. 1859, look it up. And so, in 1859 was, a, was when the, uh, Harvard accepted the Darwin's theory of evolution. And that's where case study came involved and crazy stuff from that. So anyways, we got to make sure that we stick to what the scriptures are teaching us. And, um, and so Paul here in teaching them in Thessalonica, he was trying to share with them that, that what a blessing it is that you're the first to be saved here in Thessalonica. Um, and that they're holy because the spirit has made them holy. The Holy Spirit sanctifies you and I. It sets you and I apart. If, if I accepted Christ and I believe that my life from that moment on should be sanctifying, should be being more and more set apart. Do I do the things that I did back before BC days? No. Um, no, I'm not heading in that direction. I'm not desiring the things of the world and the things of the flesh, the things of the eye, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes and pride of life. That's BC days. BC days, you want pride. That's why pride in Christianity doesn't work because that's part of our enemy is pride. Pride is our enemy. Pride is your enemy and all of our enemies. You got prideful, haughty spirits and all oh, they did this to me and all. That's not Christianity. That's your flesh. So here in verse 14, he says, he called you to salvation when we told you that the good news... He called you to salvation, to be sanctified, to salvation when we told you the good news. And that's what the good news is. That's why the gospel is good news. You understand that? All we hear now is bad news, right? That's all we got. Bombs going off in, in, uh, in, in, in France. There's bombs being planted in Lowe's and Anaheim. I mean, crazy stuff. That's not good news. It's good news that they found it. Um, good news that they found the, the bombers, but it's not good news. The whole event is, is under a negative shroud. Um, but the gospel's good news. It means I'm going to heaven. That's the good news is on our way to heaven. No more pain, no more sorrow, no more suffering, no more muscular dystrophy, no more bad backs, no more diabetic no more high cholesterol, no more cancer. No more all those diseases, no more. That's good news. And so that's what Paul's saying, the good news of the gospel. Now, you can share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, and that's what's happening. Jesus Christ died and rose from the grave. That's our, he's our leader. Jesus, not our pastor. People want to make our pastors our leaders. Let me just explain to you something. If you turn with me about this whole idea as uh, pastors, and I'm kind of running off the teaching here a little bit, but it's something that really permeates my heart because it just happened the other day. I went to the gym, I'm working out, um, and I'm always trying to share the love of Christ all of the places in the gym that I work out at. Uh, I just That's just who I am. I just love God and love to share Him about what he's done in my life and what he can do in yours. Um, the main thing is putting us in um, back into pitch. That's the main thing is getting us back in pitch. Um, and I was just sharing. And, and so what happened is um, sharing in the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is your pastor and my pastor. Let's make that perfectly clear. Um, and, and I'm not, I'm, I'm going, I, I don't want to, I'm just trying to set things right. So I'm not going to go on a negative. I'm going to go on a positive. Jesus Christ has to be your pastor. Um, in John's gospel, John chapter 10, um, if you want to turn with me there, it's kind of an important thing that he said. Um, John chapter 10, 
Um, let me see. What verse is it? We'll pick it up in chapter uh, 10, verse 7. <coughs> Excuse me. He says, then Jesus said to them again, most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. Okay, he's the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Who's that through? Jesus. That's through Jesus. The thief does not come except to kill, steal, and destroy. That's what his job is. Um, and this is the dividing line, John 10, 10 of the Bible. And Jesus says, I've come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But the hireling, he, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming, leaves the sheep, flees, and the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. See, Jesus never leaves. He's always with us. P uh, pastors, they stay at wherever they're at. They're not, can we call them all the time? Um, I was on staff. And I'll tell you what, I could not believe this. The senior pastor of this big, large church would say, don't give them everything. I, I thought to myself, what are you talking about? You got to hold back a little bit. That way they'll come back next week. Are you crazy? What kind of statement is that? Give them everything. Fill them up. That's what Jesus would do, not try to string them along. <clears throat> but the hireling he who is not of the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming, leaves the sheep, flees, and the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. That's very important for us in ministry that we're not a hireling. We're not doing it for the money. I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and my sheep are known and are known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. <clears throat> and the sheep and I have which are not of this fold and them I must bring and they will hear my voice and they will be one flock and one sheep. So again, my sheep hear my voice. That's what Jesus just, just, just said. Um, they will hear my voice. So we're to follow Christ. That's the point that I'm trying to make here. Christ is alive. He's seated at the right hand of the Father, and he's your pastor. Jesus is my pastor. I submit my life to Christ. The problem is when we start getting into this uh, shepherding, in a sense, the pastor all of a sudden becomes a position of authority. No, that, what's, the, what's the position of authority? We all should know that. Hold up your Bible. This is a position of authority. Why? Because if your pastor goes sideways, you need to get a hold of the scriptures, which is the authority. Show him he's getting squirrely in the scriptures in love. That's what we're supposed to do in love. Show him that he's getting a little crazy and that should be his correction. That should be his correction. <clears throat> so that's why Jesus is my pastor. I'm submitted to him, but that doesn't mean I'm not submitted. To, I'm submitted to everyone. I'm here to serve one another. I'm submitted. That's what happened in uh, 1535 with the Reformation. They did not want the Bible to be translated into a common language because they're afraid an unbridled spirit would grab a hold of Scripture and run with it. Unbridled spirit. That's why we need to be submitted, humble, selfless. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and follow me. We want to follow him. Um, so my model is first and foremost um, comes from the teaching from Exodus chapter 20. Um, when they were on Mount Sinai, Moses came down and told the people, God wants to speak directly to you. And what did the people say? No, no, no. No, no, no. We're scared. We don't want to have that. No, no, no. You go talk to Moses, you go talk to God. Tell him what he tell him what we say, what he says to us. And that's the same thing we're doing now. We're saying, no, 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 I don't want Jesus as my pastor. Give me this other man in front of me, and then he could be my pastor. Why? Because he's false, he has faults like me. 
And that way, when his faults show up, I can go, whoo, see that? Man, I got faults too. And man, he's so his, he does too. And man, I'm not so bad. That's not the correct interpretation with that. The correct interpretation is Jesus is my pastor and this man is a sinner like me. We're all sinners. Do I aim at my sin? No, I'm asking God to forgive my sin. I'm, at, I'm targeting to follow Christ. That's the position is to follow Christ. We have to follow Christ. So the problem laid back then, Mount Sinai, when the law came, people said, no, we need a mediator. And that's what we're doing today. We need a mediator. Let's raise up pastors. Why? Because what we can do is let's all of us people get together and we want a guy that's just going to tell us how good we are. That's what we're going to raise up this guy that he's not going to teach me through the scriptures. <coughs> Excuse me. He's not going to teach me through the scriptures. What he's going to do is I want to raise this guy up. Tell me how good I am and how hooked up I'm going to be. So that's what we do. We people, we as the congregation, we as in God's people, what we do is we want somebody that's just like they did with Moses. We want somebody that's going to mediate for us, that somebody's going to be kind of slacking off on taking such a hard road, taking such the sure way, the sure foundation, that God that's going to take building this house upon the rock. We don't want that with some guy that's going to, like me, I want to build my house on the sand because it's easier to build a house on the sand. So I want a pastor that's going to teach me to build my house on the sand. That way I'll go flock to him. I'll flock to that guy that's going to teach me to build my house on the sand. <clears throat> and that's what we're at. That's what's being raised up in America. Large, large, large buildings, large, large, large following of people that are following these guys and aren't teaching the scriptures. And that's our fault. Don't blame the, the guys that are being raised up. That's We're raising them up. It's our fault, the individual. That's why my model is the model of the first church. In the home, in the home, somebody should be teaching in the home. First thing, the family should be taught. The wife should be taught. She's in submission. The kids are in submission. The pastor's in submission. The, 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 the pastor or the teacher, I'm calling them teachers, because uh, Jesus is my pastor, so what we need to elevate is teachers. That's really the, what we need. We call these, we want pastors, but that we call them pastors, but we, want, we call them that because that way they're slack like us, and that way we can follow them, and that way we can be slack. Teacher's going to teach us the Word of God. He's going to go through the Word of God, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book, the emphasis on the Scriptures. Let the Scriptures speak for themselves. So that means the Scriptures are going to teach you through the Scriptures because we're going to go through the Scriptures one verse at a time. That's, that's the key is having that home on a block and that home is opened up to the block and then all the neighbors in that home, you minister to your neighbors, share the love of Christ. We're... We're, we're working with their neighbors now. And that way the neighbors need someone, you know, hey, I'm going to the store. I, I can't this. I fell down. Can you help me up? Uh, I, I, I can't get there. I'm, 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 can someone help me? You're right there. You're their neighbor. Do you see that difference than having a building? See, this is why we don't do this because this, uh, this, uh, this gets me to be uh, selfish. That way I don't have to minister to my neighbors. I don't have to worry about my neighbors. I'll just go to a big giant building down the street. I'll flock to that. I'll fellowship there, hang out with other people. And then I'll just go on my own merry way. You either want to play church or you're going to be the church. What is it? I have to ask ourselves that. Are you playing church or you want to be the church? That's what you have to ask yourself. We're the church. Stop playing church. Get a grip. We got to get a grip. If you don't get a grip, you're going to slip. So get a grip on this. So that's why Paul's saying here that the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, he gets the glory. So if, who's your pastor? Jesus is my pastor. I have a teaching ministry, a teacher that, that, I, I'm, uh, that I go to and he, he unfolds the word of God, but I'm submitted to Christ. And because I'm submitted to Christ, I submit to the teacher. I submit to my wife. I submit to my family. I submit to the laws of the land. See how that works? I submit to my boss at work. Now that I submit to my boss at work, I want to be the best employee they have. And they're going to say, why is that guy such a good employee? Go ask him. 
great opportunity. Let me share with you what I am a great employee because I love Jesus. And I'm thank you that you asked me that. That way I can share that with you. That's how I operate. That's how you should operate. That's how the church, the body of believers should operate. Who's the best employee? That Christian. Why? Because he just works like the Dickens and he doesn't cause trouble and he comes and goes and he helps people. Well, heck, I want to be a guy, Kim. See that? That's the witness. We don't have that today. We go to our little big giant building. We go and we play church. Oh, hallelujah. We all get excited and we all just go in there and it's like, okay, now what's for lunch? And we go out to have lunch. I'm not saying that back because we're going to go to lunch since we're over. But the idea is if I'm playing church, I don't take church with me. If I am the church, I take the church with me. And that's, that's my point. So every block have a teaching pastor that worked his tail off his whole life. He paid his bills, did his work, held his, did everything according to the schedule, according to the laws of the land. He obeyed them. Then he retired and then he opened up his home to teach the word of God, sharing with his neighbors. Then it's the next block. Someone comes to that ministry teaching home and then they open up their home in the next block. And every block in the city should have these homes opened up to share the love of Christ to your neighbors and your family. Right there. There's the church. That's how the, church, that's how the first century church is. I'm not coming up with something new here, folks. I'm just, I'm just coming to what the scripture is teaching. That's how the first century church, they met in homes. So I'm just kind of getting back to that because I'm a cheapskate. How much does a building cost? What's the overhead? How much the lighting, the waters, electricity, the upkeep? Uh, do you see what's happening? All that money should be going to feed the poor, putting schedules together that, that, that they can, the poor can now uh, not only be fed, but then they can be trained how to feed themselves. That's really where this money should be going. But we want might is right in America. Might is right. Majority rules. Might is right. So if you can get a big old building going on, and the way you want to get a big old building is you, you don't teach the doctrines of the scriptures. You get away from teaching the scriptures. And you teach how everything's going to be hooked up and hopped up and you're going to be blessed and hooked up and so happy and everything is just going to be wonderful and, and beautiful and everything is just rosy and you're going to get all your dreams answered. You're going to get hooked up and blessed and all your dreams are answered. That's what we, that's what we want to hear. But that's not what the scriptures teach. So enough of my ranting and raving. Let's get back to the scriptures. Again, the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the good news that we can obtain. That's the interesting thing. We can obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we get justified because we accept Christ. That's the first step of our road on salvation is we get justified because of what Christ did. He justifies us. Now, from that point, is I get two new parents. That's why I'm born again. I got the word of God and I got the spirit of God. See, the spirit is love. Spirit is joy. Spirit is peace, kindness, self-control. I don't see speaking in tongues in there anyways, but that's another issue all, all on its own. Uh, but that's the spirit. Love, joy, peace, kindness, self-control, all these things of flowing through love. That's your, that's the mom. That's the spirit. Then you got daddy, the word, Jesus, the word and the spirit. That's our two new parents. Okay. And that's who we follow. And that brings glory to God when, by our actions, we're bringing glory to him. And then that sanctification process that being separate because of our two new parents, we're separating ourselves from, from the old self from our mom and dad, from the system of our parents. Now, hopefully your parents were godly parents and shared the love of Christ and set you down this road to become a mature Christian, not a children of God, a child. It's, I'm a child of God. When you say that, it means I need a pastor. I need someone to oversee me. I need someone to say, don't do that. Don't do this. Don't do that. Oh, don't do that. <clears throat> I, when I was at the gym sharing the love of Christ, I saw this guy, knew who he was. 
he's working out and he had a really, I mean, he didn't have this joyful spirit over him. It didn't look like, and I started sharing with him. I, I am officially called one of those. I am one of those now. So if anybody says, who's he? Just say, he's one of those. I used to have a t-shirt that says, I'm the Christian the devil warned you about. Because it's only the scriptures. I, I'm preaching scripture here. I'm not preaching some building. I'm not preaching some name on some building. I'm not doing that. I'm preaching the scriptures. Only the scriptures. And so the glory of God. And then once that justification, sanctification, then glorification. We get to heaven, we're going to get new bodies. Glorified bodies. All new bodies. Who wants a new body today? I, I need a new body. I'm in this golf thing and this tilt, this forward tilt that I got to keep throughout the swing. It's killing my back. Woo! So I got to stretch now. I got me a mat. I got these big foam rollers. Doing all this stuff. Enough of me, but, but I, I need a new back. I need a new body. I can't wait for a new body. But I love the one I'm in. Gotta love the one you're in, everybody. Is everybody clear on that? Love your body. Okay, if I love my body, I'm not gonna abuse it. I'm not gonna abuse it by putting on clean. No, and I'm not gonna do that on a, on, a, on a patterned, scheduled life. No, I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna eat the right foods. I'm gonna exercise. I'm gonna do the right thing. Because this is the only one I got, and I'm going to want it to take me furthest at the highest potential I can get for the longest time I have. That's, that's where I'm at. Hopefully, that's with all of us, too, is you want this body to get you down that road the longest. I want to be 80, 90 years old and still running and jogging and exercising and, and, and still going strong. That's what I want to do. And your body does it. God's made us. He made the body, really, to live forever. That's his, that was his plan. For us to live forever in the garden. That was his plan. But when they disobeyed God, they did their own thing. And again, that shows us the pattern. Adam and Eve were in a beautiful environment. They could live there forever. But God gave them a choice. Why? That shows free will. He says, if you eat this tree of knowing good and evil, you'll die. That's what God said. Now, how many of us know when God says something, he means it? See, that's what God says. He means it. But you know what's happening in the world? People say stuff all the time they don't mean. And they don't back it up. So words are just words. They're just spewing out these words that mean nothing. And, but that's not the case with God. <coughs> God word. God, God is the word. And it doesn't change. So again, the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm. Stand firm. Are you standing firm? Are we standing firm? Are you standing firm in the word? Are we standing firm in the word? Or are we standing firm in us? Because if you stand firm in you, you can't stand firm in the word of God. Can't do it. Can't happen. I can't, it can't happen. You have to stand firm in the word of God. Paul's admonishing them, stand firm. Why? Because they came out with words, they came with letters, and they came in spirit. All these things about, you know, the, the missing the, the rapture, and they were unclear, even though Paul told them. See, if they would have grabbed on to what Apostle Paul told them, held on to it, all this other stuff coming their way, it's like, oh, okay, let that go. It doesn't mean anything because Paul didn't say that. That doesn't mean anything. But no, what happened is that kind of slowly drifted away. And now this something new came along, something fresh, something there in their presence, and they started to waver. They started to falter. That's why Paul's telling them and telling us to stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, by either the spoken word or by our letter. Okay, so Paul's saying, look, you know the pattern. Tradition is the understanding of just this pattern. You know the pattern, okay? So in verse 15, Again, he says, so then brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by spoken word or by our letter. 
The NLT, this is where I got the, the title for the message, says this, with all these things in mind, and again, that's what our mind needs to do. We need to mull over. We need to pour over the scriptures. Okay, pour over Jesus saying, when your enemy comes to you, it was Roman law that if your enemy, if, your, if the Roman soldier said, I need you to carry my backpack, you had to carry it a mile. It was Roman law. Jesus says, well, you know what? When he tells you to carry it a mile, you carry two. First mile is on the law. Second mile is on Jesus. That's what he told you to do. So that second mile, I'd be witnessing to that guy. That's what Jesus says. Do it another mile and witness to that guy. But see, selfish, selfish people can't do that. Selfish people are going to go, ah, oh, mile, ah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And they get on that mile. Oh, that guy made me walk a mile. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they just complain and they complain and they gripe of that mile they got to walk. And then once they're done, ah, oh, that guy, oh, man, oh, oh, Jesus, where were you when I needed you? Well, that's not what he said. He said when they do that, because he said, get ready, because you're, you're in this world, you're going to have trials and tribulation. It's coming. That's why the prosperity message, people flock to that. They want to hear that stuff. That's why people want to hear it. That's why people raise up guys that are going to say it. We, they flock to them. In masses. I'd rather prepare you for a hard road ahead of you. And if it became easy... Huh. Praise God. If it doesn't, you're already prepared. That's, that's where I'm coming from. Um, and so here it says, with all these things in mind, dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Okay? Stand firm. That means things aren't morphing in Christianity. Definitions don't change. You're standing firm. Things, that's why I love Christianity. It doesn't change. I hate when things change. I hate, I hate it. It just, it just throws me off. Uh, I went to the Roman Catholic Church as a kid. Don't eat meat on Friday. As a child, I remember going, friends went to McDonald's. We got a hamburger on Friday. I'm eating it. Oh, no. See, I was caught up in fr uh, my friends. They were, so I flocked with my friends. My friends flocked to McDonald's. I flocked with them. And then as we're flocking in there, we all flocked and got a hamburger. I'm eating the hamburger, and then I realize, wait a minute. It's Friday, and this guilt just came over me. I spit the hamburger out, and I, I just, God, I'm so sorry I ate that hamburger. Oh, my gosh. I was grieved. Of course, I had to go confession that I ate meat on Friday. You know, and it was a, it was a big sin, a mortal sin. Well, now you can eat meat on Friday. So that system to me don't work. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. It changes. It's morphine. That's why it's only Jesus. Just give me Jesus. Give me his word. And, and I'll, it doesn't change. I'll change inside to be more like Jesus. But his word doesn't change. Sin is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's the same. Jesus is my pastor. I'm submitted to him. What does he tell me to do? Love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength and love your neighbors as you love yourself. But if you get yourself a pastor at a pastor and he's going to have all these rules and regulations for you because you can't submit to something you can't see. So you got to go to somebody you can see and submit to somebody you can see because you, we don't have faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So when you have a pastor, some man that's over you that you're submitted to, <clears throat> he could be harsh. What happens if he becomes a tyrant? What happens if he changes? What happens if he stumbles and falls? What do you do then? You still follow him? Jesus never stumbles. Jesus never falls. That's why you follow Jesus. You have to follow Jesus. <coughs> so again, excuse me. Um, again, that's why he says, stand firm and keep a strong grip. I love it. On the teaching we passed on to you, both in person and by letter. Get a grip on it right here. Get a grip on God's word. That's what we have to do. You have to get a grip on God's word. It's, it's, it's the dividing line of scripture. It's the one that's going to keep you safe. It's the one that's going to keep you out of 
being a battered sheep. Battered sheep happen because you submit to men. Submit to Jesus. Put your heart, mind, soul, and strength into him. In him. Now, I submit to my boss at work. I submit to judges. I submit to police officers. I'll submit. Doesn't mean I'll follow them. Not going to follow them. I'm following Christ. But I'm in a heart of submission. Why? Because it's easy. I'm selfless. It has to be selfless. If you have a hard time submitting, you got too much flesh in the way. Get rid of your flesh. If you, if you have a hard time submitting, get rid of your flesh. Because that's your problem. Is you. That's our problem. It's always been our problem. So get a grip. Don't let go of the teachings. That's what they did. That's what the apostles did. The apostles' doctrine. You know what the apostles' doctrine were? Teaching, prayer, fellowship, and the Lord's Supper. That's what they continued in. The apostles' doctrine, the teaching of the apostles. That's why... That's why when you say that, that you, there's new day apostles today, what you do is you take the apostles that are up here that God called, Jesus called out each one of those apostles. He called them individually by name. He trained them. There are only 12. That's what Jesus, that's, that's the apostles. But now we're saying, no, we got apostles. Paul, so so and so is coming to our church, and we got 12 apostles in Salt Lake City. And Paul, what you're doing is you're taking these guys here and you're bringing them down to the level of here. That's what you're doing. <clears throat> it's like I hate people in 4th of July that throw off firecrackers all week long, and then when 4th of July shows up, you're like so tired of it. It's like, where's the celebration of independence? They spread it out over a week, and it makes it horrible. That whole thing should be reserved for that day of independence when that day of 4th of July comes out. Then blow it up. That makes that day special. That makes that day unique. But when people start spreading it out a week before and a week after, it takes that day and it brings it down to the rest of the days. It doesn't make it so special. That's why we are to keep the apostles teaching what the scriptures teach. You're not going to get led astray, beloved. You're not going to get sideways. You're not going to get all, but you're not going to get all led astray. You're not going to get some cult leader. That's really what we have today is cult leaders. It's all a bunch of cults. It's a cult because they're not, most of them aren't teaching through the word of God. We're going through 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We made it up to verse 12 last week. Uh, we start on verse 13 this week. Uh, I'm here in 15, and when I end, I'll pick it up where I left off. Puts preeminence to the word. Puts the focus on the word. You're looking at what for next week? You're looking at the word next week. If I came in there with a pastor's three-point message and pull out a couple of teachings from the scripture, again, go to someone that's teaching through the scripture. Find out. Someone says, come to our fellowship, our church. Okay, do they teach through the scriptures? Oh, no, no, no. He teaches the Bible. Huh, what do you mean? Oh, he gets a little Old Testament, New Testament, little verse here, little verse there. He's got his own message going on. So who are you looking at next week for? You're looking for Jesus? You're looking at the word of God? That model is not, that model doesn't promote that. That model promotes a man. That's the problem. And that's where cult leaders come in. This is where sheep get battered every time. They place a man in between them and Jesus, and that man's going to let you down. <clears throat> if this guy that I was at the gym working out, and, and if I was a, 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 a member of his congregation, and I saw his face and his actions, I'd say, I don't even know this guy. He did not have the love of Christ. He's a man, just like anybody. Jesus is the only one that I know that's sitting on the cross, bruised and battered beyond human recognition, there on the cross and saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's a hard place for, that's a hard place to get to. That's a very difficult place to get to. But Jesus, our pastor, my shepherd, that's what he did. 
get a grip. Get a grip. Keep a grip on the Word of God. <coughs> Excuse me. Keep a grip on the Word of God. That's what Paul's saying. Keep a strong grip on the teaching we passed on to you, both in person and by letter. Thank God he, the letters that he wrote, canon and scripture, we have them today. Get a grip. You can't, you can't let go. You can't, we cannot let go of the teachings. Cannot let go of the word of God. And, and we're, we're admonished that in, in the latter days, in the latter days, the church, body of believers, will not endure sound doctrine, will not endure sound teaching. So that's why what's happening is, again, what's happening here is we're slowly, gradually coming away from. We, we, we don't teach you through the Word of God. That's, that's stopping, okay? Now we're teaching from the Word of God, three-point messages, okay? Now we're going to just teach you principles. A lot of, lot of churches... This is my Bible. I can have what it says I can have. I can do what it says I can do. And then they take them, put them underneath their pew, sit underneath it, and they never open it up. You know how you get a, you heard this story that a frog, you put him in a pan of cold water, slowly crank it up a degree at a time. Doesn't even realize it's getting warm until he's boiled himself to death. Of course, you put the frog in the hot water, he's going to jump right out at the beginning. But if it's nice and cool and and Luke room temperature, he's going to dig it and then just crank it up a degree. That's how the devil works on us. Slowly, gradually, a little bit at a time, he slowly gets us to slowly moving away from, from the truth. And that's where we're at. We moved away from teaching through the scripture. Now we teach from it with its principles. And now we're messing around with the principles now. Now we can start mixing around. Now we can start changing definitions. And we, we get it out here, right? Because when it's here, this is it. But we start getting it out here, then we can start changing it, morphing it, molding it, and start kind of not, not be so critical and you know dogmatic about the truths. And that's where we're at. So today, the message is for all of us. Get a grip. Keep a hold on that grip. And in fact, the NLT says, keep a strong grip. Keep a strong grip. That effort, that, that ability, your strength, your might, your focus, your energy, your heart, that strong grip on the Word of God. Because when you keep a strong grip on something, you'll know when someone's trying to get it away. You'll know, and, and you'll say, no, I, I'm holding on to this. There ain't going to be no tug of war, and you're not going to rip this out of my hands. I have a strong grip on it. And that's what we need is a strong grip on the Scriptures. And only the scriptures. So hopefully this message today met you with, uh, with love, first and foremost. I love whoever's out there listening. If Will and Terry, love you guys if you're listening out there today. Hopefully life is going great up there in your retirement years, like my brother who's here this morning. In his retirement years, along with Judy. Of course, Michael's been retired for his, since he graduated from college. Um, he's retired. I think I finally retired. I'm tired now. <laughs> so we love you guys out there. Um, may the Lord richly bless you. Thanks for uh, tuning in. Um, and um, God bless you. Thank you.